I thought it might be fun to take a look at what sort of watch you can buy for 20 bucks. Now, I'll tell you what you don't buy for your $20. You don't buy a lot of packing material, and I had a sinking suspicion when this one came to the door that the tape was going to be the only thing holding it together. You also don't buy a lot of working watch for your money at this price point. If you look down the bottom left, you'll see my time graph uh, trying to inform us this is running about 500 seconds a day fast. I don't trust that result at all. Uh, this thing runs very intermittently. Now, this is a Vostok. Uh, I'm sure quite a few of you will be familiar with the brand. And I purchased it for 454 Czech crowns, which equates to about $20.20. So I don't think I'm too clickbaity here with my YouTube title. Now, the dial itself was in good condition. And as you can see from the movement here, it doesn't look too bad. Uh, it comes with extra dirt for free. So I'm going to start by disassembling this so we can get it cleaned. But for those of you who don't know Vostok, they're actually still in business today. You'll find them in many high street jewelers. They still produce mechanical watches. They have a fairly decent reputation for being sort of rugged and hard wearing. Now, the bezel on this one is also fitted incorrectly. Um, that little slot in it is supposed to be where the crown is. And the hands are decidedly wonky. So we're not off to the best of starts here. But Bostock itself, as I say, they're fairly well regarded amongst the collection community as a fairly cheap, inexpensive way to get your foot in the door with mechanical watches. I'd kind of recommend a new Vostok. Um, there's nothing wrong with them and you won't have to sell a kidney to buy one. Now I'm just removing the hands here. Um, hopefully we won't need this hour hand because I've got the feeling it's going to do that. But we do actually find it. Now, Vostok started in 1942. They actually evacuated during the Second World War to a small town in Russia called Sebastopol. Uh, they were an OEM. Uh, they manufactured quite a few different things. They became a military equipment supplier and producer in 1942. But everybody did back then. Second World War was on and you just made basically whatever was needed for the war effort. They didn't actually become Vostok until 1960. They were named after the Soviet space program that shared the same name, Vostok. Um, as I might have mentioned, it just means East in Russian. Now, they became an official supplier to the Ministry of Defense in Russia in 1965, where they created probably their most famous watches, the Commandeer Ski and the Amphibia. If you're a bit of a space nerd like me, the Amphibia Type 350 was actually taken into space by Russian cosmonaut Yuri Romanenko. Um, the guy was in space for over a year, I believe, probably not all in one go in the 1970s. But if you're just on the lookout for something that has a space type connection, a Vostok Amphibia Type 350 might not be a bad buy. Now, obviously, you've got things like the Amiga Speedmaster, the Moonwatch, of course, but you're looking you know, add a lot, a lot of money for one of those. And I genuinely wouldn't recommend if you are like me, just a hobbyist, probably taking one of those apart would be a, a very expensive hobby. So if you're a bit of a space nerd like I am, and you just want something connected with space, a Vostok Amphibia Type 350 can be had for around the $100 mark. So, you know, not quite as cheap as our, our, our boy here at the $20 mark, but I have to say on disassembling this thing, going through the disassembly process, I was remarkably surprised by the quality of this. This is a great watch for the money. This is a great watch for several times the money. It has a ink block, a shock setting on top of the balance, as you can see there. It's also got one in the bottom of the watch. It's a Breguet style over hairspring, and there's several unusual things in regards to this movement, which we'll go over as I go through the disassembly. Now I'm stripping the barrel bridge first. I take the balance out first because it contains a very delicate hairspring that I don't want to damage. But I'm just going to strip off the barrel bridge here. Nothing too unusual on the barrel bridge, just your standard click, your click spring, your ratchet wheel, which is coming out now, and the crown wheel next to it, which will come out in several parts. But again, this is all fairly bog standard stuff. So our crown wheel here is reverse threaded, which is also fairly common. I'm going to take that off and it will come out in several parts. There we go. So I do actually end up leaving that washer on the barrel bridge here. So you'll see me take the barrel bridge off and turn that over and then pause in bewilderment as to where that washer came from. 
One of the things about making these videos is everything seems very obvious when you watch it back in glorious high detail on the three cameras that I use. Uh, but when you're in the moment, it becomes incredibly easy to overlook some things. These parts are very small. And this is a hobby of mine. I am, I am not a professional watchmaker, as you can probably tell. So the barrel bridge is going to come off uh, fairly easy. Again, I'm going to be as careful as I can be to lever this up without bending any pivots, although there is uh, really not too much to worry about with this one. The central pivot there is rather large. And you'll notice one interesting feature of this movement, or you may notice, is that there's no center wheel. Um, there's a tiny center stem that goes through the middle that drives the second hand. And I believe this has probably been done to allow the fitting of a bigger balance to make the watch more accurate. I think I've seen this type of thing on a Zenith Calibre 135. Uh, I've never actually worked on a Zenith 135. They're a little expensive. Um, they did chronometers in the Calibre 135 Zenith. So you're looking at a lot of money. Uh, not something at this point in my journey that I would want to be taking apart. They're also quite rare from what I understand. So with that comes a certain expense. But we get to see a, um, a kind of copy-ish of what that would be like here with this Russian watch. And as I said, you know, you've got the nice signature there, which is Russian for 18 joules. You've got the B on the train bridge, which is coming off now for Vostok. Uh, I think the reason why this brand is often Vostok or even Vostok with the W is simply trying to uh, equate the Cyrillic alphabet to the Latin alphabet. It is actually Vostok and pronounced as such as far as I know, although I'm sure some Russian viewer will tell me I have the pronunciation all wrong. But as far as I know, it is Vostok. So a very unusual configuration of wheels here. That's our second wheel, and it's got a friction pinion in it that goes through to the other side of the dial to run an indirectly driven minute wheel. Uh, it's kind of strange. I've never seen this configuration before. Like I say, I, it is similar to the Zenith 135 that I've seen somebody else work on, but I've never done it myself. So we'll go more into the inner workings when we've got this stripped, but we've also almost got the back side of the watch stripped now. There is that barrel complete, which will contain the power source of the watch, the mainspring. And there is that little, little, tiny uh, pinion thing there that drives our second wheel. Now, I'm going to take off the, uh, drives our second hand, sorry, not wheel. I'm going to take off the pallet cock here, or pallet bridge. I believe it's a cock if it only has one screw, but somebody might want to correct me on that. I'm actually genuinely quite curious because I've heard it referred to as both. But taking off that pallet cock there will allow me to access the pallet fork, which will come out. And then we'll be on to the dial side of the watch to undo the keyless works. Now, this cannon pinion is not friction fit because of the design of the watch. It doesn't have to be. And you can see there our minute wheel is held in place by a spring. So it's kind of free sprung. Uh, I'm going to take the cover plate off and then I'll remove the wheel and you can have a look for yourself. So there's a little cover plate holding down the minute wheel. Now this is unusual. I haven't seen this particular configuration before, like I've said. I quite liked it though. A very interesting movement to work on. And you can see that spring there that's holding that wheel in place. And that's connected to the other side of the watch via that friction pinion on the second wheel. So disassemble the keyless works here. I wasn't really expecting any surprises. Um, very rarely is. Keyless works in a watch this age have been very well established. There's a way to do it. Uh, so I'm going to take off the setting plate, uh, sorry, the cover plate here, which contains the setting jumper, which allows us to jump from setting the watch to winding the watch. And that will come off. And as I say, I'm not expecting too many surprises and I don't really think I found any. So you can see our yoke being held in place by its yoke spring. Now these can be a little bit tricky. I normally cover them up with a piece of plastic. A commenter suggested I weigh them down with a piece of radico and do it that way. I think that's probably a cleaner way to do it than always having a big bit of plastic handy. The other way I've seen it done is with a bit of peg wood, which is just uh, wood, like it looks like a wooden toothpick basically for watchmakers that doesn't have any sap or residue associated with it. 
So you can use one of those as well. You'll often see me use those in uh, taking out springs. Several ways to do it. I like the plastic. It, it gives me a better sense of security. You know, as a hobbyist watchmaker, I don't have perhaps the access to spare parts that a professional organization would have. So losing stuff for me is, is kind of a big deal. So I'm always a bit extra careful. So the keyless works coming apart and I'll go over this part by part when I put it back together. But there is our uh, intermediate setting wheel there and our other wheel. Like I say, this this part of the watch is fairly um, unusual for me. Uh, it might be more common than I think it is, but I've never seen this before. So this was worth the $20 for me personally, just to get to take this apart, put it back together, try and understand the thought process that went into making it. Uh, I always find that a little easier if I have the thing to physically take apart and put back together. Um, it, it just clicks in my head a little better. So I'm going to remove the screw that's holding that long spring in place. Now, I would have been very smart to put a piece of radico on the end of this just to make sure it didn't go into outer space and follow its brethren. Um, where I have catapulted many springs in the past, I can assure you. So a little bit of radico on the end here would have would have been marvellous. But of course, I um, I didn't but we kind of get away with it uh, more luck there than talent i think so we're almost done with the disassembly of this i need to remove the shock setting now there's a shock setting top and bottom on this watch that i believe were in-house shock settings so there was a company that sold shock settings in fact there was a couple that most manufacturers were using i believe this is a vostok in-house shock setting and there's one here and there's one on the top of the balance cock as well um, just for to support the top and bottom of the pivots on the balance stem so there is our dial side of the watch completely disassembled now i'd also take a minute here as we go into the cleaning portion to disassemble the barrel uh, because it will contain the mainspring and the mainspring also needs to come out for cleaning now i'm hoping that this is from what i can see it will be a russian kind of teespring um, it's got a little t hook on either end which makes it a real pain to get back in so i was hoping it wasn't one but you can kind of see already that it is so there's a little um uh t hook kind of contraption you'll see it better when i put it back together on the spring that fits into the top and bottom of the barrel now this can be really tricky to align when you're getting the spring back in from what i remember this one didn't give me too much trouble but they're not beloved in uh, watchmaking circles from what i understand now the spring comes out fairly easily i'm trying to keep one thumb over the spring because there's a lot of tension here it is a spring after all and i really don't want that to ping out and hit me in the head which uh, has happened to me on several occasions now i'm going to try and be careful when i get to the end of the spring because obviously as the springs nearly unwound you will find that it will shoot out so i've gotten quite good at having that not happen to me uh, and I can demonstrate, yep, there we go, exactly how good I am at having that not happen to me. But there it is. Everything is out of the barrel now, so that can all be cleaned. And I'm never sure how much to show of this cleaning process. Um, so I want to take this time to ask you, the viewer, a quick question. So I've edited quite a few of these watch videos together now. Uh, you may have seen some of my earlier stuff. If you haven't, give it a look if you think it might be of interest. And in this case, I've edited it with quite a few of these kind of split screen effects. Now, I'd like to ask you to shoot me a comment if this is something you don't like. Um, because this takes a long time to edit together. It takes a long time to do. And I have no aspirations of becoming a professional video editor. So if this is not something that you like, or it is something you like, please let me know, because I would hate to do all this work and not, um, not come out with something that people actually want to see. I personally really liked this sort of split screen format. I think it tells a much better story of all the parts in the watch and where they are. Uh, the extreme close-ups are very good. I'll, I love to use them, of course. But if you're not a watchmaker, you're just watching this for fun. Uh, I've been told that a lot of people use me to go to sleep, which is absolutely fine. I do the same thing on other videos and channels myself uh, on those occasions when I'm having difficulty sleeping. 
But do drop me a line in the comments, please do, if you find this edi editing pleasing. I'm kind of hoping you do because I kind of like it. And I, again, I genuinely think it tells a good story of the watch. So you can see the shock setting has been disassembled. There is a shock spring and the jewel in there. I'm not going to show that on camera. I will show the reassembly. Uh, so I didn't really see the point of showing the disassembly. They're both the same. Now I put the balance back into the watch here, the balance complete, uh, just for cleaning. And I will put the screw back in. This just makes sure that my hairspring doesn't get tangled up with any other parts. Now I use Elmer Luxury Clean uh, Waterless Cleaning and Rinsing Agents. It's a three-step process, so it goes into an ultrasonic cleaner in the cleaner, in the cleaning fluid, the Elmer cleaning fluid, and then I do two rinses in the rinsing fluid. Now, this has been specially designed for watches and leaves the surfaces perfect for lubrication. Now, the spring has been cleaned, the barrel has been cleaned, and I'm going to use these antique watch winders to wind the spring back up. Now, these things are great. I managed to find a set of eight. There are different sizes. Unfortunately, you can't just buy one. I managed to find a set of eight for around $100, I think maybe 120 somewhere around there. Now, if you're thinking of getting into this hobby, these aren't necessary. They're often extremely expensive. A Bergeon set can cost into the thousands of dollars and you can buy a new mainspring for around 10 bucks um, over here in Europe from Cousins or, you know, other different retailers in America. I'm sure it's probably even easier. There are Chinese sets for sale. In fact, I own one. They tend to be caliber specific. And to be honest, in fixing vintage watches, I have never used the Chinese set. So I didn't think I'd be able to find a vintage set for a reasonable price. I bought the Chinese set. The Chinese set and the vintage set turned up at the same time because, you know, of course. And I've never used the Chinese set. The vintage set does everything I need. The Chinese set is, it's not badly made, but it is, as I mentioned, caliber specific. And a lot of the calibers that came with it, I mean, they have several winders in there for Rolex, for instance. Uh, I don't know why you would be servicing a many thousands of dollars worth of watch with a cheap Chinese winder. But I thought they were the only option for me, so I bought them. I might save you a piece of advice if you're mainly working on vintage stuff uh, or if you're wanting to give this a go and you do want to wind your own springs. I wouldn't really recommend the Chinese ones unless you are working on the calibers that they come for. So I'm going to do a little bit of oiling of the barrel, a little bit of Mobius 8200 grease. Uh, I'm going to use a little bit of grease. I used way too much in my last video, which several of you were kind enough to point out. And I really do appreciate the comments, guys. I am no expert at this by any means. So see me do something wrong. If I get something wrong, please do let me know. Um, I don't, I genuinely like constructive criticism. So as you can see, the spring just pops back into the barrel with the aid of this antique kind of ancient 1960s winder, I think. And I'll show you now, I can show you a better look at the slot on the top of the barrel that fits into that T-hook on the spring. Now, obviously, we can't put it back together like this because the barrel arbor is not in. But just for demonstration purposes, I thought I'd show you that. So I love these winders, by the way. Um, they rarely come up on eBay. If you want to set Pick them up. I'll link down below what mine are and who made them. If you want to get the same ones, I can't recommend them highly enough. So a little bit of oil again for the top of the spring. This is a Mobius 8, 2000, 8200 grease. Uh, and again, I over oiled this the last time, which several of you were nice enough to point out to me. Um, one of the reasons I film these videos is watchmaking is a very rewarding hobby, but I don't have a mentor. I, I haven't been to school for this. It's generally nice to meet folks on YouTube. I found the watch community to be extremely friendly. I've never really had. Uh, obviously, you hear horror stories about people's comments sections on YouTube. I've never really had any comments that were negative at all. I've had a few pieces of advice, which again, I thoroughly appreciate. But anyway, there is our barrel all back together. That lid's just a press fit. There's a little plastic tool you can buy for it. Now, I'm going to show some of the oiling on camera. I'm not going to show it all. Some of it requires fairly hefty magnification. And oiling is one of those things I still am not fantastic at. So 
Um, it's not really something I want to show in 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 great detail right now, um, just because I don't have the equipment for it. Now, this Christmas, a friend of mine did buy me a camera for my microscope, so hopefully we'll get into more of that as we progress on this journey, or as I progress. So in goes our wheel there, our escape wheels going in, and now one of our third wheels. So this is the second third wheel here. Uh, I assume these are two third wheels. I'm not really sure how to describe this. Um, I know what they're doing and what they're driving, but I, this is, movement is, is kind of new to me. Um, and for $20, I mean, really, you can't go wrong, can you? You get to play with something new. Now, this is the second wheel here with friction pin on, friction pinion on it, connecting to the other side of the watch. Now, that wheel that would be the center wheel is connected to the second, um, the, the little stem there that drives the second hand. So, kind of unusual design. Um, like I say, I'm not too experienced in this. I've been doing this for uh, uh, quite a while now, but it's not my main job by any stretch. So this I'm putting in is the setting lever pusher, which will allow us to get the stem in and out. And the reason I'm putting it on now along with all the wheels is a lot of the time when you get the barrel bridge on you will not be able to put that in so this would not be the first time I have screwed down a barrel bridge only to have got the setting lever screw or the setting lever pusher now I'm not going to screw these down right now I'm just going to put them on and align all the pivots because I've never seen this before I want to make sure that I've got everything correct I'm, I'm kind of trying to be as careful as I can be because I'm not too familiar with it so I'm going to get both the barrel bridge and the train bridge which is going on now uh, onto the watch and then I'm going to test that the trainer wheels is running freely here you go and then I'm going to screw them down with fairly gentle pressure and then I'll go back and really crank them down and tighten them up when I am sure that everything is where it's supposed to be there is of course the danger that I have a pivot that's not engaged so the pivots come through the top of the jewels there on the bridges if you if you weren't aware you can see them coming through the top of those jewels and if you don't have that right and you kind of crank down on a screw um, you can end up bending them now talking about screws I know what happened here but this screw is the wrong size this is the wrong screw I'm even using a screwdriver that's too big but for some reason I do not know this so we do come back and fix that if you are currently screaming at the monitor uh, I understand completely but we do come back and fix it so uh, all the screws for the bridge is on. Now we did a previous test of that train of wheels just to make sure everything was running nicely. And again, I'm taking extra caution here. I'm just making sure that I can see all the pivots coming through the jewels. You can see a pivot coming through the jewel near the B there for Vostok. The Cyrillic B, I assume, which sounds like V. Which, yeah, Russian, not my major thing. Now you'll see here that I use another screw that's too small, but I spot it this time. So they have the same thread. They will screw into the holes. They're just not correct. Um, no idea how I missed the other one. Uh, normally the movement is designed in such a way that it's fairly obvious if you've got the wrong screw in there. And I can see it down the bottom left-hand corner on the video here. It, it should have been fairly obvious. But as you can see, our wheels are running freely. So I'm moving them from the first wheel, the bridge, uh, the bridge, the first wheel, the barrel complete, and everything's ticking very, very nicely. So I'm going to get on with oiling the crown wheel. And as I said before, not oil, not all of the steps of the oiling will be shown. Just because of the magnification issue, uh, really. Um, but as I said, like a very nice uh, gift for Christmas this year was a camera for my microscope. So hopefully I'll give you guys a better look at this at some point. And uh, you can tell me where I'm going wrong, which would be absolutely fantastic. Um, you know, free education. Well, in this case, not free, $20, but I'll take it. So the crown wheel going back together, the three parts that make it up there. And this is a fairly standard crown wheel. I've seen this on quite a few designs. Nothing to see here. Just really the trainer wheels that's a little unusual on this one. And that um, second uh, 
pinion and the free floating minute wheel kind of not seen that before uh, get uh, a design that leaves no center wheel so you can get a larger balance in as i believe i mentioned now i'm just going to run a piece of pegwood through this make sure that wheel is spinning freely i don't know why i am taking so much time with this i think think uh, I, I, as I was spinning it I detected maybe a little resistance but it was fine so before I go on with the barrel bridge I'm going to actually put the pallet fork back in this will lock up the train of wheels this will stop everything rotating freely so when I put power into the watch it doesn't just immediately wind back out this one's not too hard to fit as I mentioned this watch very nice um, like I've paid a lot more for a lot less. I, I can tell you that much. Um, I genuinely surprised. I worked on a lot of Russian watches and this is one of the nicer ones. Um, everything from its slightly unusual design, very modern design for its time as well. Now I expect that the suspect that this watch is from around 1980. Uh, maybe 1970 it's kind of difficult to date a lot of this stuff but the movement itself is from the 50s so it's a very modern movement that allows for some very kind of um, modern horological takes everything from the click spring to the way that the train of wheels goes together to allow a bigger balance and stuff like yeah i'm i'm impressed um especially for the price i paid so the click and click spring going on there, the crown wheel uh, already on the ratchet wheel next to the click wheel. And if you didn't know, by the way, the click wheel is called the click wheel because it makes up part of the ratcheting mechanism. And that's what makes the click, click, click sound when you wind the watch. So if you've ever wound a mechanical watch, you'll hear it go click, 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 click. That's what the click wheel does. So you'll see where the spring interfaces with it there. This allows it to be returned to act as a uh, stopper on that ratchet mechanism when you've finished winding the watch. So the power just doesn't, well, immediately come out of the spring. So once this is together, I'll screw down the crown wheel and I think I show it on video. You'll see me as I screw down the crown wheel. As I keep screwing, I'll actually come to wind the watch. So I can actually wind some power into this watch right now and uh, we can check to see if the pallet fork jumps from side to side like it should. This will tell us whether we're actually getting that power delivery that we are looking for. So as you can see, this watch winds quite well. Um, have to say having had it on wrist now for a while uh it's smooth as butter the winding mechanism keeps well i'll save it to the end um there are a few things that don't go according to plan but we'll save those for the end and you can see my pallet fork is jumping around quite freely there so it's time to flip it back over to the dial side so we can get on with the keyless works So I'm going to put the spring in first. There's no real reason why this has to be fitted as the first component. It's just I kind of have a love-hate relationship with springs. You can see me trying to keep it in place there with a bit of pegwood. Now, a better idea here, having thought about it and seen the video, would have been to put a bit of radico, uh, again, Watchmaker's Blue Tech, on the end of that pegwood to uh, to stop the spring flying off it just helps weight the spring down because uh, the springs are they weigh nothing at all fractions of a gram uh, and when they go they go so a little bit of oil for our sliding pinion here um, that will interface with our winding pinion so again not showing every step of the oiling trying to get what i can on camera though uh, our sliding our winding pinion sorry a little oil for the back because it will rub against the back of the case there you can probably see some wear marks although not many to be fair um, I've seen a lot of uh, movements where that's worn down to the base metal even more worn should I say um, than this one because this one has a few marks on it but it's not too bad at all so there you can see the sliding, sliding and winding pinion interface together quite nicely. Now I'm just going to add a little bit of grease here to where the yoke would sit. Now you'll only see me do one drop of grease there, but I actually do three because the yoke won't spin round in a circle, so that oil won't distribute itself. So you need to actually wipe all the way around. 
But there our yoke goes in and you can see how that interfaces with a sliding pinion. So as that moves backwards and forwards, that will engage the sliding pinion either into winding or setting mode. Now I'm going to put a little bit of grease again where the setting lever goes. And again, I probably don't show it all. I try to edit this video so I at least show the mistakes because um, I actually am not trying to hide the fact that I am just a hobbyist, obviously. Um, but I've also tried to edit in such a way that we're all not here for four and a half weeks. So our set lever goes on there. And I'm just making sure that all of the parts of the keyless works are in the right place. I say this movement is unfamiliar with me, uh, unfamiliar to me, sorry. So if you'll perhaps see me over test things, it's just because I'm trying to figure out in my own head how everything goes together. Um, I, I, I like to puzzle out how these things work rather than go back and watch the video of me disassembling it. This gives me a better understanding of how the watch works, which... You know, as I'm not a student of a watchmaking school, you kind of got to figure out some of this stuff for yourself. There are some great YouTube videos, don't get me wrong, some excellent, excellent watchmakers on YouTube. Um, and I've read a few books, but it's rather a bit different doing it than reading about it or see someone else do it. So we got the yoke spring going back in, and I'll probably use a little bit of plastic again on this. As I said before, you can use a little bit of radico, a little bit of pigwood, variety of ways of doing it. Some probably much more elegant than the way I'm doing it here. But this one gives me a lot of confidence that I'm not going to lose that spring. Um, because they do go, like I've had one land in another room, I'm not sure how, or maybe it was stuck to a part of my clothing, because these parts are actually lightweight enough that they they will stick to your clothing just through the friction. They're not heavy enough to fall off. So this causes no end of problems, especially if you don't notice, you walk into another room, uh, you're never finding it again, and finding spares is quite difficult. Now, I've also oiled the two posts that these gears are going on, but somehow I've cut it out of the edit. And you might notice right now, if you have some experience with this type of thing, there's a gigantic mistake here. The yoke has slid out of the sliding pinion or the groove in the sliding pinion where it's supposed to be. And it's currently jamming the sliding and winding pinion from being able to connect with each other. So I will not be able to wind or set this watch. Now I'll come back and correct this on video in a little while. But just so you can see that there, what happened is the spring pushed that yoke over and out of the little um, groove in the sliding pinion and now it's in the wrong place now i haven't spotted it even though there is a hole on the cover plate here that contains the setting jumper uh, there's a hole on the cover plate there specifically to allow you to look through to see if that yoke is engaged with the sliding pinion and i've still missed it as i mentioned one of the things with these videos is actually quite funny to go back and watch yourself like in this much detail because the job that you think you've done that's stellar uh, turns out not to be quite as good as you thought it was. For me especially, like just um, as I said, just a student really. Now this screw is too big also. Uh, but it's the last one I have in the box that's not a movement screw. And this is when I remember the small screw on the other side. So those screws are just swapped. So I'm going to remove the small screw from the other side and fit the correct screw. Now you can also see here where I'm highlighting the hole where you should see the yoke engaged with the sliding pinion, but you do not. Um, there's a hole left specifically there for you to have a look at that. And I have not taken advantage of it. So we're going to get this kind of unusual, as I said, friction uh, minute wheel in here. Now, I'm unsure if that actually needs the oil or not. I would guess so, but it's not actually grinding up against the side. I'm not sure on this one, and I wasn't sure which type of oil it should be. So I used a kind of heavy oil uh, as it's metal on metal. There's no jewel. But again, this is kind of new to me. So I'm just making sure that that is sitting in there with the friction of the spring. And then I'm taking it out again because I've got to oil the jewel underneath. And now I'm watching this on video. I missed that in the edit too. The tip of my oiler there was broken. So that oiler was way too big um, because at some point the tip is broken off. But as I said, little mistakes. Uh, we, keep a, we, we keep calm and carry on as they say. Now I need to reassemble one of these shock settings. So I'll show you this here. 
Uh, before I put the shock setting back on the bottom of the watch, I'll need to do this. So a little dot of oil on the flat side of the jewel here. And these jewels are minuscule. I cannot tell you how easy it is for these to just whop off your tweezers. The point of the jewel is it's supposed to provide a frictionless fit for the pivots so the pivots don't wear away, they don't grind down. But because the jewel is damn near frictionless, trying to pick it up and move it around is, is a tricky task indeed. Now this screw here is microscopic and I'll spare you my butchery of it. I slipped with the tiny screwdriver I have, wasn't honed enough, and I've actually damaged the screw. So I'm going to replace that because damaged screw, especially that damaged, unacceptable. But I'll do that off camera. You'll probably see the replacement screw in there at some point when we come to the wrap up. But yeah, I didn't want to show that. Um, with the really small screwdrivers that we use in watchmaking, you really have to maintain your equipment. And I was a bit lax and that led to a damaged screw. So uh, my apologies, you have to see that absolutely shocking. So I'm putting the spring back in the shock setting. Now, this is not a captive spring. A lot of shock settings will use a captive spring. This is not one. I prefer the captive spring because these things are you know, not that much thicker than a piece of paper and they are springy. So they will go. So I'm going to oil some of the jewels on the bottom here. Um, that one I didn't actually oil because it's the pallet fork and you don't need to. So again, unfortunately, I can't show this under higher magnification and you really, really need that higher magnification. Now I'm going to use a bit of oil here on the bottom of the barrel. I'm going to use a little more heavy grease here on the setting lever. That's probably a little too much. I'll come back and clean off that stuff on the top with a bit of radico. Not actually mission critical for that, but it's still a little too much. So we're back on the back side of the watch and the balance needs to go in. Now this is really going to be the telling point. And so this is the point where you know if you've got it right or if you've got it wrong. Well, you won't know if you've got it exactly right until you test it. But if she don't tick, you'll know you've got something very wrong. So this watch doesn't have much power in it. I'm not expecting a fantastic amount of amplitude out of this. Um, uh, but I was expecting a bit more than that. So you can see she wants to go. It's fairly low amplitude. So I'm going to clean the shock setting on this and screw it down and see if we get a better result. So this is where the shock setting cleaned. I'm not going to show that because I just showed the bottom shock setting being cleaned. Amplitude looking uh, actually very nice. Now, this is where I go to test the keyless works, the winding and setting of the watch and figure out that that yoke has slid out of the sliding pinion. Uh, which, you know, as they say, the man that never made a mistake, never made anything. So we're going to get that fixed now, I believe. But isn't she pretty? Like, it's always a relief uh, to see that balance drop in and uh, have everything spin back up. Now, I say I got some low amplitude to start with. Uh, could have been a number of reasons for that. The watch wasn't very uh, wound very much. And also that top shock setting was a bit dirty. And, you know, uh, after a cleaning and uh, uh, screw down of the balance, make sure it was seated properly, our amplitude ticked back up by eye, of course, it looked very good. So I'm going to rejigger this uh, yoke into the correct position and then redo on the top plate and we'll just pretend that that never happened. Now, obviously, I could edit that out of the video, but I like to leave the mistakes in. OK, this is a journey for me. And also, I generally like to encourage anyone that wants to have a go at this to have a go at it. And even after you've been doing it for a while, mistakes get made. I've, I've seen very, very good watchmakers make, you know, mistakes. It just happens, um, happens to the best of us. So I like to leave the mistakes in. Um, it, it also helps me get some advice from uh, you, the viewers, which is always welcome, of course. And now you can see that sprung minute wheel there, which I'm having a bit of a job getting to connect to that non press fit cannon pinion. And now the hour wheel can go in and now that all connects everything together, our hour minute wheel there. So there you go. There is the keyless works actually doing their job now. And when I pull the crown, obviously I'll be able to go from setting the watch to actually winding the watch. 
So it's time to get this thing back in its case. Now, before we do that, we've got to have some sort of crystal for it. And this one came with a crystal and a bezel, the press fits. Now I'm using the world's cheapest watch press here. And I've just 3D printed a little, I'm not even sure what you would call it, a little die that allows me to compress the crystal into the bezel. You can also just bung the crystal on top of the bezel and push it down with your fingers. That will work too. This way I found slightly more reliable. I would like to get my hands on a proper screw press, but they're a little expensive right now. Um, free money is not really going around uh, the last couple of years, it seems like. So let's get the dial back on and we'll need to do up those dial screws. Uh, the ones I used at the start. Now, the dial's in great condition. There is what might look like some dust. That's actually some damage to the varnish. I'm going to give it a bit of a dust up and uh, dust off, should I say. Um, and this one just fits straight into the, into the case there. Now, we're going to pretend like I didn't forget to put the dial washer on. Um, there, there we go. Absolutely did not happen. And I'll put the hour and minute hand back on. They're just a press fit, and I'll show you the second hand going on now because it's rather nice. This whole watch is rather nice, actually. Very sort of Bauhaus design, dress watch-ish. Um, like, I would have no problem rocking this watch. It's a great watch. Uh, irregardless of price, it, it's a great watch. The movement's really nice. It's well finished. Uh, it ticks. It, it looks pretty. Um, it's, I mean, if you don't like Bauhaus simplistic design, then this might not appeal to you. But if you do, um, sort of reminds me of the Young Hands Max Bill, in a way, I want to say. Um which is a far more expensive watch, although I think a very good watch. I uh, also like that one. But, you know, for, for a few quid, we all got 40 minutes, I guess this bit here will be, worth of entertainment out of this thing. And I got a nice watch to wear. Um, now, I'm actually going to arrange the bezel here so it's on correctly with the slot cut in it that actually covering the crown. Uh, it was not on correctly when I bought it, and I'm going to use the press for what it was designed for now, which is just to press on bezels and case backs. So bezels go in on first, and then I'll press the case back on. Other unusual case back, this one, very small, so um, I decided to put the bezel on first. And if I'd captured the audio from this, I'm going to try and also capture the audio of me working as well. I think it would be a nice background audio to have. But here is our watch uh, put back together. Now, this is sped up. Um, obviously, it's not running this fast. It'd be kind of cool if it was, uh, but it's not. So uh, I just thought this looked nice. And you can see there that it ticks away nice, really nice, smooth sweep of that second hand, even though it's not a particularly high beat movement. So how do we do? Like, I really like this watch on wrist. Now, I have a fairly small wrist, so this kind of size suits me. It's 36 mil, I think, 36 and a half, maybe. Um, and certainly the trend has been towards very large watches, but that seems to be dying off now. Some 38 mils coming out again, some 40 mils. So this one I really, really like. So that's it. We're back together. I Genuinely hope you enjoyed this restoration. Please do let me know what you thought about the edits, uh, all the split screen and stuff, if you like that. I am going to leave you with this thing on a time grapher, um, just so you can see a before and after. But it's been a genuine pleasure talking to you. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it. My name's been David. This is Saving Time. Thank you very much for watching.